Chapter 25 The Bud of the Lotus Opens It suddenly seemed to Carmenita as though something living were moving in the depths of the lake. In the crystal deeps he became dimly aware of a rising shadow. The waters bubbled and seethed, and a large lotus bud, red-tipped, shot like a fish above the surface on which it then lay swimming and rocking. The waters themselves rose and sank in ever-extending rings, and for a long time afterwards trembled and glittered into fragments and radiating light, as if the lake were filled with liquid diamonds. The reflection of the watery coruscations flickered up like miniature flames over the lotus leaves, the robes and the faces and forms of the blessed. Carmenita's own being trembled and radiated in all its hidden colours, and over his heart there also seemed to dance, as if in happy play, a reflection of joyous emotion. What was that? his glance asked of his blue neighbour. Deep down, among the far distant worlds on the gloomy earth, a human being has this instant centred their heart's desire upon entering again into existence here in Sukhavati. Now let us also see whether the bud will develop well and finally blossom, for many fix their desire upon this a pure abode of bliss, and yet are not able to live up to its fulfilment, but, on the contrary, they entangle themselves again in a maze of unholy passions, succumb to the cravings of sensuality, and remain bound to the coarseness of life on earth. Then the bud withers away, and at last disappears entirely. This time, as you see, it is a male. Such a one in the checkered life of earth falls more easily on the path to paradise, and for this reason you will also notice that even if the red and white are about equal in number, amongst the blue, the females are by far the more numerous. At this communication, the heart of Carmenita quivered strangely, as if all at once joy blended with pain and sorrow, bearing a promise of future happiness, had set it vibrating, and his gaze rested upon a closed lotus flower nearby, as though seeking the solution to some riddle. It was as white as the breast of a swan, and rocked gracefully quite near to him in the still, gently moving water. "'Can you remember seeing the bud of my lotus rise from the depths?' he asked of his experienced neighbour. "'Surely, for it came up together with that white flower that you are now gazing upon, and I have always watched the pair of you, at times with some anxiety, for fairly soon after its birth your bud began perceptibly to shrivel up, and it had almost sunk beneath the surface of the water when all at once it raised itself up again.' became fuller and brighter, and then developed magnificently until it opened. The white one, however, grew slowly but gradually and evenly, towards the day when it should open, when suddenly it was attacked as if by some kind of sickness. It recovered, however, very quickly, and became the magnificent flower you now see before you. At these words there arose in Carmenita such a feeling of joy that it really seemed to him as if he had been hitherto but a sad guest in a sad place. To such a degree did everything now appear to glow, to smell sweet, and to breathe music. And as though his gaze, which had rested unwaveringly upon the white lotus, had been a magician's wand for the raising of hidden treasures, the apex of the flower began to move. The petals bent their edges outward to droop gracefully down on every side, and lo, in their midst sat the fair varsity, with widely open eyes, whose sweetly smiling glance met his own. Simultaneously, Carmenita and Varsity stretched out their arms to one another, and hand in hand they floated away over the pond towards the bank. Carmenita observed, of course, that Varsity had not as yet recognised him, but had only turned towards him unconsciously as a sunflower turns towards the sun. How could she have recognised him, seeing that no one, immediately upon awakening, remembered anything of their previous life? Even if at the sight of him dim presentiments might have stirred in the depths of her heart, as had happened in his own case when his neighbour spoke of the heavenly Ganga. He showed her the gleaming river, which emptied itself noiselessly into the lake. In the same fashion, the silver waters of the heavenly Ganga feed all the lakes in the fields of the blessed. The heavenly Ganga? she repeated questioningly, and she drew her hand across her forehead. Come, let us go to the coral tree. The groves and the shrubbery are so beautiful over there, and the blessed are playing such delightful games, said Varsity, pointing in another direction. Later, first let us go to the coral tree. You will be refreshed and revived by its wonderful perfume. Varsity followed him willingly, like a child that one has comforted with the promise of a new toy because of not having been allowed to take part in the joyous games of her friends. As the perfume began to float towards them, her features grew more and more animated. Where are you leading me? she asked, 
as they turned into the narrow gorge among the rocks. Never before have I been so filled with expectation, and it seems to me in the past I have often been filled with expectations, although your smile reminds me that I have only just awakened to consciousness. But surely you have mistaken the way. We can go no farther in this direction. Oh, we can go farther, much farther, smiled Carmenita, and perhaps you will now become aware that the feeling of which you spoke has not deceived you, dearest Varsity. Even as he spoke, there opened before them the basin of the valley amid the malachite rocks, with a red coral tree and a deep blue sky. Then the perfume of all perfumes enveloped her. Varsity laid her hands on her breast as if to check her all too deep breathing, and in an intense intermingling of sympathy and expectation, Carmenita discerned, in the rapid play of light and shadow on her features, how the storm of life memories was sweeping over her. Suddenly she raised her arms and flung herself on his breast. Carmenita! My beloved! And he bore her thence, speeding back through the gorge with eager haste. In the open valley with its dark shrubbery and thick groves, where the gazelles were at play but no human form disturbed the solitude, he descended with her, finding shelter under a tree. Oh, my poor Carmenita, said Varsity, what you must have suffered, and what you must have thought of me when you learned that I had married Satagira. Then Carmenita told her how he had not learned that from hearsay, but had himself, in the main street of Kosumbi, seen the bridal procession, and how the speechless misery graven on her face had directly convinced him she had only yielded to the pressure of her parents. But no power on earth would have compelled me, my only love, if I had not been forced to believe that I was in possession of sure proof that you were no longer alive. And Varsity began to tell him of the events of that bygone time.